We're operating in faith. <laughs> that the Lord is smart and faithful and all those things and He's going to accomplish what He wants to accomplish. Amen? Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And I want to read uh, actually two verses of Scripture, verses 5 and 6 of Hebrews chapter 13. It says, let your conversation, and if you look that word up, that uh, conversation, it's actually dealing with character. Uh, and has to do with mode. Um, so he's talking about your character, your, your lifestyle, what people are seeing. Let your character or lifestyle be without greed. That's what the covetousness there means. It's actually avarice, which is dealing with greed. And be content with such things as you have, for he has said, and this is what I want to draw your attention to, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do unto me. An interesting passage of scripture, um, so I'm saying boldly that the Lord is my helper. <laughs> you with me? That he doesn't leave me or forsake me. I believe that we're supposed to talk to you about living in the supernatural. What's supernatural? It's over and above the natural, isn't it? Well, according to this verse of Scripture, the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. How is that? Because He lives in us. So if the Lord lives in us, then the potential for living supernaturally is always there. Right? But we have a mindset that People helped us with <laughs> along the way, okay? To um, expect these great spectacular things and that God's going to just come down out of heaven and, and do something. But you know, <clears throat> when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, He came to stay. And now it's a fact of receiving what's already here. Do you follow, do you follow where I'm coming from? And I know with Cornelius they had a, another phenomenal event to occur because God crossed the line, the, the racial barrier between the Jew and anyone who wasn't a Jew. So it took a supernatural event to do that, something spectacular in this particular case. And even after that occurred, you can read this in the 10th chapter of Acts, but if you read the 11th chapter of Acts, where Phil, uh, Peter goes back to Jerusalem and, um, and then he gets called on the carpet for going to the Gentiles and actually fellowshipping with the Gentiles and um, you know, Peter, somewhat a devout Jew himself. And so he pleads his case. And he ends up by, he sums it up by saying, these guys were with me, so I have witnesses. And the Spirit of God fell on them like he did on us. And they began speaking in tongues. And they said, who am I to withstand the Lord? In other words, 
God told me to go. I did what God told me to do. And God did something in this particular case in a spectacular way. And they said, okay. <laughs> then prophecy was fulfilled because throughout the old covenant, God had he'd been talking about how the Gentiles were going to be, my paraphrase, blessed. You understand? God was going to cross the line. He was going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, not just on the Jews, as Joel said. So, we're living in an era to where the Spirit of God has already been poured out. And He's here. But we have to receive the Spirit of God in the inside of us. And you look at uh, the 14th chapter, uh, verse 14, I mean, John 14, 26, and John 15, 26, and also in John 16. And Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth. He uses different identifying titles for the Holy Spirit. And that He is going to live in us. Live in us. And so if He's in me, then He never abandons me. And really that's what forsake when He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will never abandon you. You'll never be without me. But how often do we feel like that we're disconnected? That God's not there? And the truth is, He's, he's there all the time. So if we're disconnected, it's because I hung up on Him. <laughs> you with me? He didn't disconnect from me. I may have lost communication with him or he may have spoken something to me and is now expecting me to walk out what I know. You follow me? And so those times may be somewhat silent when you're walking out what you know. But I've learned the more I pay attention, the more... I get the more information I get. And I've learned that it's not God doing anything differently. It's me doing something different. And it's called paying attention, giving attention to the Lord. It's called listening to the Lord, expecting the Lord to speak. Now, the scripture that we read this uh, just this afternoon, you know, I always get before the Lord and ask Him, uh, "What do you want us to do tonight, <laughs> or this morning, or what? What, what do you want us to do? Not what do you want me to do? What, what is it that you're wanting to do in this place? And what's my role? I may just be the conductor of the orchestra and." The other instrument's playing. I'm, I'm fine with that. You understand. And I believe that we're going to see more of that. That's, that's an anticipation that I have of um, people understanding God in them. And that you don't have to be um, somebody special per se. For God to use. Do you follow me? Whether it's through uh, uh, verbalization or it's through an action. Um, God is wanting to be seen in earth. He's wanting his kingdom established in earth. And I was talking after service this morning to some. And um, I just feel like the... I've had a, a, I don't know if you want to call it a directional change or a, a change in my thinking, I think would be a better, better way to say it. All my life growing up in church, it seemed like we were programmed to live good enough to get out of here. And just pray that I'll hold on until he comes. I've heard that more times than 
not cured of repeat, okay? And the idea is just let evil take over the world, just get me out. And now, in the last few months, I'm beginning to understand that Jesus actually meant what he said when he said to pray that the kingdom of God would come and the will of God be done on earth. Now, how is that going to be accomplished? Through the body of Christ, obviously, right? Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's waiting until his enemies become his footstool. So who is he waiting for? Us? You know, it's just as a slang term, the ball's in our court, you understand. So where people have been waiting on God to do something spectacular, something supernatural or whatever, God has already done the supernatural in that he put himself in us when we yielded to him through salvation and the reception of the Holy Spirit. How much more supernatural can you be or get than to have a nature change? How many of you can actually tell a marked difference in your life since you were born again? It's a change, right? There's a diff the desires change. And the more you subject yourself to the scriptures, the more your thinking changes. And God is wanting us at this point in time, I believe, to get to where we are thinking supernatural instead of natural. Which simply means that we're doing what Paul told us when he said you have the mind of Christ then we're becoming aware that we actually do have the mind of Christ. It's been revealed to us through the Word, plus the Holy Spirit is in absolute agreement with Jesus and the Father, right? And so the potential is in us to live supernaturally every day. Now, I've, I've always, uh, you know, for all those years in church and all that, I, was, I thought of supernatural as something uh, uh, sort of mystical and, and out there. And it's just simply making your decisions from the inside instead of the outside. You don't let the circumstances dictate. You don't react. You have a plan of action from the inside. Now, I was just pondering on the, the ministry of Jesus. And if you just look at this on, a, on any given day, every given day, okay. Um, Jesus, he just gets up and he goes through that day not getting upset, caught by surprise. And yet he's in a natural body that is subjected to all these environmental things, all the negativism, everything around him. But in a negative world, he's living with a positive attitude of what could be, not what is. He came to seek and save the lost, not to condemn the lost. The church needs to get that mindset as well. And so if the Holy Spirit is in you, the gifts of the Spirit are with Him. And the fruit. The nine fruit of Galatians 5, 22, 23. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the gifts of the Spirit. So... The Holy Spirit didn't come to live in you without bringing anything with him. (laughs) 
Why is it that we have difficulty understanding that that power that Jesus operated with, the fruit that Jesus displayed, the potential for that is on us because it's the same Holy Spirit, isn't it? So Jesus said in John 14, 12, that he who believes on me, he who believes on me, that is the key. He who believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. Now, why would he say that? Because he said before he left, I'm going to my father so I can send the spirit of God to live in you. Do you understand that the Spirit of God is the very, the life or the essence of God in us? To where it's God in flesh again. And when I say flesh, I'm talking about a physical body, not carnality. Okay? So then, the supernatural lives in a natural body. You follow me? And so the supernatural is in a natural world. Now the thing that's so amazing is people can pick up, I'm, I'm talking about heathen, people that don't know Jesus, can actually pick up on some things because they're sensitive to the inside and we call it intuition. Or a hunch and actually can sort of see things and know things before they happen y you follow me how much more should those who have the spirit of God living in them be able to tap in to the spirit world and to know what God's doing See, he's revealing his secrets to us. But we have to get in and listen to him in order to know the secret. If you would say uh, to me, I have a secret I want to share with you. And I'm saying, go ahead. You say, no, I don't, I don't want everybody around to know it. And I think, well, if you want me to know it, you tell me. <laughs> then I'm never going to know your secret. What I'll have to do is get close to you. And you've played the games and all where you sit beside somebody and this person says this and you say that and, and it gets all goofed up as you go through there because we're not hearing clearly. God is communicating clearly. He's speaking clearly. But he may be speaking in parable form. But only those who have spiritual ears will understand the parable. You with me? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Isaiah said to have ears to hear and eyes to see, but they don't hear and they don't see. Why? Because they're looking naturally, they're not looking spiritually. And that's been our problem in the church world, is even though we profess Jesus, even though we're looking to live eternally with Him, die and go to heaven, as the old saying so commonly goes, and yet we're oblivious of the eternal life that's in us. It's already begun. We're already in the kingdom. And we're thinking it's going to be later. So this is a supernatural kingdom. Are you aware of that? That God's kingdom is a supernatural kingdom, which simply means it can do things no other kingdom can do. It will defy the natural laws by superseding the natural laws with the spiritual law. That's why after Jesus' resurrection, he'd just walk in a room, wouldn't he? With the doors locked, the doors closed. And he could appear. Or even before that, how could he walk on water? 
How could he do the miraculous things that he did? He thought outside of natural. If you think naturally, you'll see defeat. You'll see limitations. But if you think spiritually, you see victory, and there are no limitations. What can't God do? You think about that. What, what can't God do? And if God says something, can he not back up what he says? Can he not carry out, if he tells you something, it, can he not carry that out in your life if you cooperate? I think about the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. Uh, it wasn't that long a journey to get into the promised land. Actually, from Mount Horeb, it was an 11-day journey to the promised land. And when they went up to the edge of the promised land and peeked in, they didn't like what they saw. Obstacles. Now, here in this life, you're just going to have to resign to the fact that everything is not a bed of roses. And for you to carry out the will of God, there is opposition. But the greater one is in you. In other words, the supernatural in you can overcome the natural opposition against you. Does that make sense? The person's defeated when they think they're defeated. The person that doesn't believe they can be defeated keeps trying. They don't give up. I've read some uh, history of uh, some inventors. And it's been really amazing when you look at how many things that they invented that didn't fly, so to speak. Nobody wanted it. There was no demand for it. And so you could just toss that on the shelf or in the trash can or whatever. It didn't work. But there was something in them that kept them pushing to invent. They had that heart. That, that thing was put on the inside of it. There was a guy that I don't know how familiar you are with the lockout hubs on four-wheel drives like on the old Ford Broncos. You get out and you twist the things. You know. The guy that invented that had tried many things. And all of them, by the standard of the world, it all failed. But when he hit that, he got rich. <laughs> you understand? He wouldn't give up. There's something on the inside of him that's saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can get it, you can get it. And that's the way we have to be with the things of the Spirit. But what keeps people from stepping out in the Spirit? Fear? Fear? What if it's not God? What if it doesn't work? How many people have been deprived of the supernatural because we let the natural override the supernatural? On the inside of us, we have a prompting. We have a nudge. And I'm, and I'm just going to share with you a little bit on how the Spirit of God actually works in a person's life to step out for God. It's not, um, it's not earth-shaking things uh, that God says, thus says the Lord. I've never had him to do that with me. But it's like uh, I could be reading and something would just illuminate. When that happens, I know the Lord's talking to me. Or, all of a sudden, without any promptings 
from myself, you understand, or from anyone else, I can be impressed to do something. Now, am I going to follow that impression or am I going to explain that impression away? Like promptings. Well, why would I think that? Well, let me ask you, why would you think that? Are you just a super intelligent being and all this type of stuff? Or is it possible that you didn't? It was put into you. The Lord put it into you. Now, how do I know if it's me or the Lord? <laughs> well, does it agree with the Word? Does it agree with the Spirit? Does it agree with the character of Jesus? Those type things. The bottom line is, it's going to come through your thoughts. You understand? He speaks in here, but it comes through your thinking. But make sure that it was initiated down here, not up here. You with me? A lot of people, every, it's, just, it's almost a fad to say, well, the Lord said this to me, the Lord said that to me. And the bottom line was, um, they just decided they want to do this. They just decided they want to do that. Or somebody may have said, you ought to do this or you ought to do that. And this type thing. But when the Lord speaks to you, to me, it's different. Uh, it, it may be very faint, a whisper, a thought, or all of a sudden you know something you didn't know before. Now, why did I know that? How could I know that? You understand? And don't ever look to the response of other people to determine whether you hit it or you didn't. I've had the Lord to reveal things to me. And sometimes it happens, you know, when a lot of people get on what we call a prayer line or whatever, and they, they come before you, and you don't know anything. And all of a sudden, when they're in front of you, you know something you didn't know before. Well, it's God revealing something that you didn't know before. Now, you make the choice whether you speak that out or whether you just pass it off. And I have, and I, I use caution in, in the way I do that, especially if it's a, can hit a nerve, <laughs> okay? But I have said something before, um, and the person denied it. Well, I, I have to make a choice. I can say, well, I miss God. Well, I can say, person lying. I didn't miss God. And I'm not talking about being arrogant and cocky. But I'm talking about becoming so proficient that you know you didn't miss God. You follow me? Now, until a person opens their heart to the Lord, they're not going to receive from the Lord. And the Lord's not going to stand there and just badger. You understand? If, if, if you don't want Him to minister to you, He won't force entry. It's always by, it's by invitation. But I believe that anyone in this room that has the Spirit of God on the inside of them has the potential for operating supernaturally. But don't wait for it to be some flamboyant thing. It could be just a prompting to go talk to somebody. They encourage somebody. Just be a friend. You don't know the impact that that has on the person's life. And then there are, uh, there are times that, that the Lord is not uh, speaking to us to get some great result, but to sow a seed. 
And you have to be content with sowing a seed. And a lot of times that can come through uh, encouraging someone that's uh, uh, ready to give up or quit. And, and, and I'm not talking about just flattery and uh, uh, lying and stuff like that. But to where you see potential in that person and you tell that person you encourage them. God's with you. Don't give up. You can do it. You can do it. If at first you don't succeed, try again. If you don't succeed, try again. How many papers have been written that were denied the first time? I had a man to tell me one time he is, uh, was pursuing a doctoral degree. And, uh, of course, you have to write a thesis. And he wrote his thesis, and they denied his thesis. And uh, so he rewrote his thesis, and they denied his thesis again. After taking the other studies, and all he had to do was stay with it to get the thesis, he got discouraged, disgusted, and never wrote the thesis again, and never got what he was pursuing. It wasn't that he couldn't. You with me? What am I doing wrong? Find out what you're doing wrong and correct it. You with me? It's it's just like Cain and Abel and God accepting Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. And God said, if you do well, he's talking to Cain, if you do well, will yours not be accepted? Of course. So what would you do? Lord, what am I doing wrong? Right? What, What am I doing wrong? And let me correct what I'm doing wrong so I'll be accepted too. You follow me? It's, it's not complicated. But here again, and you'll hear this out of me all my life, I suppose, is this discipline. It's, it's to where you discipline yourself not to quit, not to give up, but you pursue the things of God. And that you deliberately start thinking supernatural. People around me see me natural but I'm not natural I don't have to go in a telephone booth and change clothes and come out with a big S on my chest you understand Um, we're not there to get attention you understand that's not what the body of Christ is about but we're there to represent we're there to give God attention now let me ask you this how much attention is God getting out of our lives if we don't operate supernaturally. We're no different than anyone else. And there's more to it than just being morally good. Well, that's noble. But there's people that are morally good that aren't serving God. They serve themselves, but they're morally good. Do you understand? And God is wanting us to understand that there is not a moment in your life that He's not in you. So the potential for the supernatural occurring at any time is always there. Now, you don't manipulate, you don't coerce, you don't force, you listen. Right? But you know what one of the hardest things there is for people to do? It's listen. The you know, we've done some study on this from throughout the years. and um, Most people, when they're talking, engaging in conversation, rather than listening to what the person's saying, they're thinking about what they're going to say in response. So consequently, you're not digesting everything. And so often we think we heard 
but we actually didn't hear to the point of understanding. You heard the words, but you didn't hear the meaning. Why? Because you're not listening to the heart of it. How many people do you know by heart? Paul said it this way, from now on, and I'm paraphrasing, I've made the decision not to know anybody, not even Jesus himself, after the flesh. I'm going to know him by the Spirit. I'm going to know him by heart, not by history. And we've, we've got to get beyond natural eyesight, natural hearing, to where we start perceiving. And that's what Jesus would do. He could perceive, or Paul could do, he could perceive. He perceived that the man at Lystra had faith to be healed. What if he hadn't perceived that? then he wouldn't have told him to get up and walk, would he? And this is where we've got to step over that old traditional religious line of if God wants you to do something, then he's just going to take you over. See, I thought that for years, just like I'm speaking in tongues, that God was just going to... Take me over and make me say and do things I didn't want to do. I had a horror. And this is why it took me so many years to receive the Holy Spirit. I grew up in a church they called Holy Rollers. And we saw some stuff. I mean, I've seen them roll in the floor, you understand, under the pew. And, and it always scared me as a kid. You know, have you ever seen anybody bring a chicken's head or cut the chicken's head off and the thing just... Flop around, I'm like, I don't want that thing on me, you know. And I'm that's that was my vision of, of some of the some of the things I saw. And I thought, and, and that's not my that's not my character, that's not my nature. You understand? I'm not out to be seen. <laughs> Let me get behind the curtains and get the Holy Spirit quietly, you understand. And so and I had the wrong mindset. That God was just going to take over and make me do things I didn't want to do. And it took years. And some simple practical teaching. To make me realize that it's not about God taking you over. It's about you submitting to the Lord and receiving the fullness of the Spirit. You just receive the fullness of the Spirit. And, and I found out God wasn't wanting to make a fool out of me. And that's sort of what I thought was, was going to happen because there was a lot of emotionalism that wasn't necessarily Spirit. You with me? Just emotionalism. Some people just, they like emotions. A display of emotions and, you know, the, the wilder, the better. And then, the, you know, you talk about those Holy Ghost services. But during the week, they live defeated lives. So what did it do? You understand? You just, you just, you just got on a high. And, and that's not what God's about. It, it's about living in a realm to where the circumstances don't control you, but you stay in control of yourself to where the circumstances don't dictate whether you failed or you didn't fail. You understand? Or you succeeded or whatever. Now, I can tell you as a minister, I deal with that every week. Because there's always these uh, temptations to come to tell you how horrible a job you did. And that uh, it's fragmented, it didn't make sense, and, and all these type things. And why do you think anybody didn't come to hear you? Well, they don't. So I get that settled in a hurry. Okay? 
I'll just agree. Nobody would come to hear me. That's not what it's about. It's about hearing the Lord. I don't even come to hear me. I want to hear the Lord. You follow me? I want to live in that arena to where I hear God talking. And if I hear God talking, I'm going to hear his desires. See, this is what happened to Isaiah. He heard God talking and he heard what God desired. Who can I send? That's the question. That wasn't a command Isaiah go. It's just saying, who can I send? Now you know what he's wanting to do, and you say, me? <laughs> I'm, I volunteer to do for you. I volunteer to, to go for you. What is it that you want me to do? And see, this is where the Lord is wanting us to live with that servant heart, that servant attitude. Not thinking, well, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. But with the mindset, Lord, if you send me, then you will empower me to do what needs to be done. You follow me? And so get confident in God in you. The Spirit of God on the inside of you. And don't just act naturally. And don't be stupid. <laughs> You understand, trying to be super spiritual. Hear, obey. That's supernatural. When you hear God and you obey God, that's supernatural. Isn't that simple? And that's where He's wanting us to live. So we need to work on our hearing. And the way you work on your hearing... Is by paying attention. You start tuning things out over here and listening. You know, when I worked as a mechanic, if we had a someone brought a car in and had a noise and trying to isolate that noise, I had a stethoscope put in my ears. It has a probe so I can pinpoint anywhere. You thought only doctors used stethoscopes, right? But I could put that on there and pinpoint, and I could tell where the noise was the loudest. And so I know where to look to get the problem resolved. Well, we have to get tuned in to the Spirit and start probing, so to speak, uh, what the Lord's saying. When I read the Bible, probing what it's saying. I read the Bible with an ink pen in my hand. Uh, here, here at the office. That's why, that's why sometimes I have difficulty even uh, reading some things. Uh, because it's, it's right, just this afternoon. Uh, and I'm, I'm reading in Deuteronomy at this particular setting. And just just seeing some things that's standing out to me there in Deuteronomy. Now what that does, it gets in you. And at some point in time, maybe two years down the road, the Spirit of God may prompt you with that particular scripture for a particular setting, for a particular situation. It's not that you memorized it, per se, but you were familiar with it. And because of your familiarity with the Word of God, God, the Spirit of God can recall those things that you put in your heart. And when those things happen, memorization is natural. The Spirit of God recalling is supernatural. Do you with me? Get it in. Get it in. Get it in. Get it in. And let the Spirit of God prompt you every day of your life. You're working on the job, wherever you are, let the Spirit of God prompt you. I was doing some things yesterday, and uh, actually, even Friday night, I uh, was working on Sherry's car. And uh, I had a couple situations there, it was giving me a fit, and I just said, Lord, I need help. 
And I'm telling you what's the truth. Just like that, what I had been trying to do, it didn't work. It just went right on. Now, you don't get a bigger hammer. Finesse. Talk to the Lord. You with me? And I'm learning that's the way to live. Do you include him in, in everything you do? Do you include him? And it's amazing just how wise and smart God is when you include him. And then what you think you were doing naturally, you superimpose on that by listening to the Spirit. And that natural thing became a supernatural thing. And that's where God's wanting us to live. Amen? So, let's begin living supernaturally. Amen? Okay. Father, I thank you that you bless us indeed. You enlarge our territory. Your hands with us to keep us from evil so that we do not cause pain. And I thank you for blessing us and keeping us and for making your face to shine upon us and being gracious unto us. You lift up your countenance upon us and you give us peace. So, Lord, we're glad to invite you to rise up and let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. Amen. Amen. Amen.